What's going on, people? Welcome back to Curtis Shaw TV, back with another transfer video. And today, I've got a special guest in the building. He's been flying this transfer window, if you don't follow him on social media. Transfer expert, I'm going to call you today. Ben Jacobs from CBS Sports in the building. How are you, bro? I'm good. We were just joking off air that if I'd have known you were a Nottingham boy as a Leicester-born and breeder and fan, I probably would have cancelled this show. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job I told you a minute before the show started then, isn't it? <laughs> no, but listen, great to have you on. And um, listen, you've been doing great things in this transfer window. I just wanted to ask you before I pick your brains a little bit. How is the transfer window for you? Do you Are you excited because there's a lot going off or is your workload like twice as much and it's really busy? How do you, how do you find it? Not necessarily twice as busy because I don't cover every single transfer or club. And that's because yeah. CBS, my full-time employer, are more kind of feature-led or big name orientated. So Chelsea's become a big part of this window because they've been taken over by an American-led consortium and yeah. teams like Arsenal naturally come into the conversation, especially, for example, with a player like Gabriel Jesus, who is known... Yeah and followed across North, Central and South America. But the thing about the window is that as a journalist and as a fan, I think you can consume it in one of two ways. The first tactic is to want to know everything, all the twists, all the turns and get minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day updates. And the yeah. second way of doing it is to be a little bit more patient and try and relay news when things develop. And the challenge as a journalist is that 50% of your followers want an update every five seconds. I can post something now and in five minutes, 50 people will ask me for an update, but logically <laughs> nothing has changed since my last update. Yeah. And then you get quite frustrated as a fan and as a journalist because there's demands to update. But the reality yeah. is, is that transfers, even fast ones, don't move in a matter of hours at this stage anyway of the window. So yeah. what I try and do and encourage fans to do is follow a transfer from interest to talks or bid to conclusion of that talk or bid. And then there might be some follow-ups. And then obviously you then get to the point of an agreed fee. And from there, I think even with a Gabriel Jesus, which took a little bit more time, you start to understand that the deal will get over the line. So what I like to add is a little bit of insight into either the player's yeah. thinking or the agent's thinking. And sometimes transfers are not told from the perspective of a player in a swap deal or the selling club and so on. So hopefully I can add something a little bit different, but I'm certainly not looking to have a Fabrizio Romano style life. <laughs> you, a thousand transfers a day with every single twist. Otherwise, I think by the end of the window, I wouldn't have any hair left. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you on that one. And listen, like I always say, people go and follow him on social media. I have to admit, I'm a little bit guilty of it myself. Like every 10 minutes, I'm, I'm pressing refresh. You know, what's happened in 10 minutes? And it's usually the same thing. But um, I just wanted to start off, obviously, by speaking about Arsenal. Uh, I put a question out to a lot of uh, my subscribers and they've thrown a lot of questions. But just generally, you mentioned Gabriel Jesus there. The club announced it yesterday. I mean, I think we knew over a week ago the deal was done. So we didn't know why it took so long to announce it. But what do you make of that signing? How big a signing do you think that is? And you know, we've seen reports that Arsenal maybe beat four or five clubs to his signature. Do you think that's probably because of, of first-team football and playing up front? I think absolutely. You summarised it well. Gabriel Jesus wants to be a focal point in the attack and is fully sold on Mikel Arteta, who, of course, he knows really well. And yeah. I would go so far as to say this is a flagship signing for Arsenal Football Club. And the reason for that is because Gabriel Jesus is not only a natural goal scorer, but the goals that he will add, even in a lower style estimation, should be the difference or would have been anyway based on last season between Arsenal being in the Champions League and outside of it. And that's exactly yeah. what is needed at the football club. And you look at Gabriel Jesus and his numbers, and when he starts games, he has a contribution, assist or goal in excess of 75 times in the starts that he's made. And I yeah. think that, that tells you that his goals per minute, his assists per minute, his direct contribution to goals is phenomenal. When he doesn't start, 
the numbers dip. Now, some of that is because you're coming on and it counts as an appearance and you only got a few minutes. So yeah. it's not always the best stat to look at from the bench unless you're only looking at from the bench in 20 plus minutes. And even then, it's often not a reflective indicator. But Jesus wants to start more and he yeah. believes his numbers back that up and Erlen Haaland arrives at Manchester City and he knows that his game time is going to be even more limited. So it makes sense all around. But make no mistake, Gabriel Jesus picked Arsenal, not just because of Edu, not just because of the fit, but Arteta specifically. And he was very active in the deal. And I think Arsenal have learnt over the course of Arteta's tenure, how important it is seeing what a manager like Pep Guardiola or Jurgen Klopp does to have the manager as part of the pitch early. And direct conversations between Jesus and Arteta got this deal over the line, as I understand it. And there were other options, but Champions League football or other suitors that came into the mix were not of interest to Jesus. And the reason for that is because there's no point in leaving Manchester City for, let's say, Tottenham, who were one of the more serious suitors prior to them then determining Rickarlison was their focus. There's zero point in joining Spurs. And I don't just say that. I agree with that. I, want <laughs> I mean, we're coming into a side that has Kane, Son, Mora, yeah. and so on. And they already have depth and Jesus would not be a focal point. He's not going to be the first attacking name on the team sheet because Tottenham have yeah. got a range of different options and goals and form players as well. At Arsenal, due to the style, due to the other names, due to the Aubameyang exit and so on, there's a real opportunity to be that focal goal-scoring point. And I'm sure that Martinelli will continue to weigh in as well. Yeah. And there's options there. And there's no sort of pressure on other names now around Jesus, in my opinion, if he succeeds and is the focal point, because I believe that he will be Arsenal's top scorer if he starts yeah. and finds his form and gets into the groove. That's not some rocket science prediction. It's just common sense. And if he gets going, Arsenal get going and Arsenal qualify for Champions League. So I think that he's a marquee signing and at 45 million and his age factored in. I think that is a bargain price and just a really smart bit of business from Arsenal. Yeah, no, you, you made some great points there. And like you said, I think that 45 million um, price in this market with strikers is, is an absolute bargain. And uh, the one year on the contract, I'm sure, benefited us in that, in that scenario. Do, do you expect Arsenal to go for another striker? Because a lot of people saying we need a plan B, we need a taller striker. But with Nketiah signing 100 grand a week, Jesus coming in, do you think that'll be that in terms of the striker market for Arsenal? I think we're so early in the window that you can never rule out strengthening. Like you don't spend 45 million on a player like Jesus and then immediately try and find a second oh, yeah. comparative to strengthening the defence first. So I think yeah. that's the priority. And if another position player comes in for depth then it's still yeah. much more likely to be a midfielder but very likely a goal scoring midfielder which is why Tielemans continues to be spoken about on almost a minutely <laughs> basis on my feed and he would tick a box again of somebody that isn't your main striker focal point but gets box to box and chips in with goals. And then you've got versatility, you've got the tactical ability to switch things up, and you've got goals coming from everywhere in your attacking midfield, from out wide, from behind a striker, and hopefully if it all goes according to plan from Gabriel Jesus as well. I know that Skamaka has consistently been linked, historically speaking, with Arsenal mm. as well, and there's reports that a bid has been rejected. We're talking weeks, if not months ago before the window even opened when talks began there and nothing seemingly materialized but again it's a long window and the thing by the way to understand when you hear that a bid has been made or a bid has been rejected and this is a key point that maybe fans don't always see or understand is that if you put down an offer whether that is verbal or formal if the selling club rejects it the buying club very often say they never made a bid and that's yeah. why 
you often get this complete confusion over, is it a first bid? Is it a verbal bid? Was it a bid? Were they just talking about it? And fans end up pulling their hair out and pasting things saying, you said no bid was made and this person said that one was. And that's largely because if a transfer is heading towards either not happening or just a fee not being agreed in the early stages, partly as a tactic, for other clubs maybe in the market and partly as a PR saving face. You yeah. definitely find that the club that hasn't succeeded start putting out a narrative that a bid has been not made as opposed to rejected yeah. because they don't want that failure out there. And they also don't want the amount of a rejected bid out there in case they're going to come back in and then a rival suitor also enters the race. So that also is why you get a lot of confusion. But I don't think the attack is the priority. I think Arsenal have already got in Vieira, they've got in Jesus, they've got in Marquinhos, they've got in Turner. So there's four yeah. to begin with in a kind of spine. And then a centre-back will be needed and some kind of central midfielder would be the next two. And then when you start adding up the maths of all of those deals, there's probably not much budget to bring in another attacker unless a free transfer becomes available. And yeah. that's where you start looking, for example, about these growing rumours, not specific to Arsenal, by the way, just so people don't get overly excited <laughs> around a player like Paolo Dybala, wow. who everybody thought was going to move to Inter. And now suddenly Manchester United are circling. Arsenal are bound to be linked, but there's nothing there at this point. And the reason for that is because, as you correctly say, if Arsenal had another attacker, they want height. And Dybala doesn't fall into that category. And that's probably why any notion of Arsenal coming in is highly, highly unlikely. But Dybala to the Premier League more broadly is definitely growing. And there's a ton of clubs, including Arsenal historically, that have looked at the player. And the reason for that is not just because he's a phenomenal talent and the wage that he's on is only about 100k. I say that very glibly, but in Premier League terms, trying to give him a little yeah. bit of a pay rise, but keeping him in your wage budget isn't going to be that hard either. So whoever gets Dybala will have got an extremely smart piece of business. But I honestly don't think that that will be Arsenal. Jesus is their priority. They've landed the target. And I agree with you that if another attacker is going to come in, you're looking for height. And Dybala yeah. doesn't quite tick that box. But Vlaovic, who was obviously a player Arsenal did bid for in January and were very bullish and actually deserve credit for their approach because they altered the market and the players thinking and they tried everything they possibly could have done a little bit like Chelsea and Rafinha they moved decisively and fast but unfortunately all it did was trigger Juventus and that was where the player wanted to go but that yeah. tells you that that model of player is also in Arsenal's thinking which is why you can't rule out another attacker but like I say I don't think it's their next imminent move uh, Martinez or a player like him in that position is kind of next on Edu's list. Mm. Um, one of the reasons as well why I wanted you on today was obviously I saw that you was a Leicester fan <laughs> and we keep talking I mean I saw a report um where you'd said that Arsenal had, had had very positive talks with Yuri Tillemans, that he seemed keen on joining. So every Arsenal fan sitting there going, well, we need the player, the player's willing to join, the price looks reasonable. In your opinion, why have Arsenal not seemingly made a real move for Yuri Tillemans yet? Because everybody's kind of saying, well, we need a midfielder, a Xhaka upgrade. Why, why have they not made an offer as such yet? Yeah, it's a great question. And obviously, from the outside in, you do look at the form of the player, the potential, the contract winding down, the fee, which even at a maximum would only be in the early 30 millions and might be able to be negotiated cheaper. Although Leicester are very seasoned and tough negotiators, but you know, it's going to be somewhere between 25 million. And let's say at the maximum inclusive of add-ons, 35 million. And Leicester's aim is to get back what they paid for Tielemans and Arsenal and now other suitors who are creeping into the conversation are trying to consider a fee if they put down a formal offer of something more like 25 plus add-ons. Yeah. And it's an interesting one because Vieira, who came kind of out of nowhere, was the signing that delayed an Arsenal decision on Tielemans. The situation, yeah. as I understand it, is that Arsenal know from historical conversations with Tielemans that 
really now date back a year that the player will join if they put down an offer. So it's not a case, as I understand it, of if it's a case of when should Arsenal choose to make the signing. Tielemans is there. He's waiting. He's always wanted Arsenal. Even before he joined Monaco, he had an opportunity to join Arsenal and he was worried at that stage about first team football. But he's had this possibility of Arsenal throughout his career and a return now to a possible deal is kind of rounding off a full circle narrative in the sense that he didn't think it was the right move earlier in his career, but now he believes it's the perfect opportunity with or without, and obviously it is without, unfortunately, from Arsenal's perspective, Champions League football. There's no truth that Spurs have advanced anything or are looking to hijack the deal. Basuma is fine for them. And therefore, the other rivals at the moment, loosely speaking, also don't have any Champions League football. And they are Newcastle, who have made a very basic inquiry under Dan Ashworth, but nothing has advanced, and Manchester United. And we're going to see this pattern throughout the window, Martinez being another good example of Arsenal versus Manchester United for targets. And Eric Ten Hag at the moment does have slightly more imminent priorities. Malaysia is completing his medical. Ericsson has a verbal agreement. De Jong is kind of taking a different twist practically every every hour. But obviously Manchester United have been negotiating that one as well. And let's say they don't get De Jong. Tielemans may become a more urgent priority. And Ten Hag definitely also likes Tielemans. So Arsenal kind of have to... On the one hand, be careful here that another suitor doesn't come in quickly and then they end up not getting Tielemans because they're indecisive. But they also have to factor in that the more suitors, the more Leicester are going to hold out for as well. So if Arsenal want Tielemans, at the moment they can get Tielemans, but Arsenal haven't come in for Tielemans. So for whatever reason, and only really Edu and Arteta know, they've not pulled the trigger yet. If they do then it's a deal that they can get because the personal terms are there. They've spoken to the player and his agent. They've put in a heck of a lot of work to the deal. And I think when you look at Milinkovic, Savic versus Tielemans, the former, if you want him, is going to cost you the best part of 60 million. Tielemans is going to be 25 to 30 million. Tielemans knows the Premier League. He is growing still from strength to strength. There's still areas of his game that can be improved. He's box to box. He's a goal scorer. I can't find an argument purely from my personal opinion. And I'm not speaking via different sources here. I'm talking to you as a Leicester fan who's watched him week in, week out. I do not see a logical reason why Arsenal do not proceed at the price available for Yuri Tielemans. And if they do, they will get the player. But Edu and Arteta, for whatever reason, haven't prioritised it yet. It's a long window, and I still think there's a very realistic possibility that Tielemans to Arsenal will happen. So they've certainly not walked away from the deal. But there's been this delay that is opening the door to other suitors. And Arsenal have to be very careful, therefore, that that isn't at the cost of either losing the player because they don't revisit it quick enough or factoring in that there'll be more interest, the price just goes up. And all of this is part of the dynamic of the transfer window. But I think Arsenal can be confident that if they do choose to proceed, and it is still an if at this stage, they will get Tielemans. Because as I said right at the very beginning, he is sold on an Arsenal move. That's a crazy one. I think most Arsenal fans are scratching their head thinking, just get that one done. It's a priority position for us as well. But... You, you mentioned Milinkovic Savic there. I mean, a few reports. I mean, it doesn't look too concrete, but there, there are even some in Italy saying there's been an offer rejected and they want 60 million for him. I mean, have you heard much about that? He had a good season last year, got a couple of years left. Do you think maybe that's why they've delayed Tielemans to look at, at somebody else? I mean, it's very possible if Arsenal are strengthening that position that they're exploring all possibilities. Milinkovic, Savic, as you say, had a brilliant campaign for Lazio. He scored 11 times and he got 11 assists as well. So the numbers are there. But it's going to be really difficult, this one, for Arsenal. And again, there's reports, like you say, out of Italy that bids have been rejected and so on. And I come back to what I said before, that 
often you'll get conflicting reports on the formal or verbal bid front after yeah. something has been rejected. But what I do know from a Lazio perspective is that they are going to hold out due to interest and to put off suitors for something in excess of 65, even 70 million plus add-ons. So it's going to be a massive wow. outlay just to kind of peak interest. And I think that Lazio for the right price will be open to a sale, but it's whether Arsenal and other suitors are going to kind of be scared off by that. And naturally, when you look at Milinkovic Savic at, let's just say, for the sake of it, 70 odd million and Tielemans for 25 million, there's yeah. not only the ability with that extra money to bring in one more, but Tielemans is a safer signing due to his Premier League knowledge. Milinkovic Savic is a phenomenal player, high in demand, but it's going to be really, really difficult for Arsenal to get that one over the line, where it's going to be really, really easy for Arsenal to get Tielemans over the line if they choose to place a formal bid. And what's interesting with Tielemans is that at no point have Arsenal placed a formal bid, even before the window opened, when it looked highly, highly likely to be done immediately after the international break. They hadn't actually put anything down with Leicester, whereas we're obviously hearing with Milinkovic Savic that a offer of some sorts has been presented you always have to take that like i say with a pinch of salt and the other thing is sometimes the club will put down a low ball verbal offer just to test the water and that can be commonplace as well as a negotiation tactic but again it doesn't really mean too much so it's a case of monitoring milinkovic savage but i do think it's going to be a really difficult deal to negotiate as far as the financials are concerned yeah Oh, well, I just hope they end up with one of them and don't miss out on both of them. You know, that's that's always the risk with Arsenal. Um, you you did mention there um, this kind of head to head Arsenal and Man United have have had and and been linked with various players. This Lissandro Martinez, who kind of came out of nowhere, and and it seems as if United maybe have got the upper hand at the moment. And I'm kind of looking at him, thinking, well, if Arsenal put forty three million pound on him, where does he play? Because is he a better left-sided centre-back than Gabriel? And he's not naturally a left-back ahead of Kieran Tierney, I wouldn't think. So where do you think the interest is coming from? Is it more just for squad depth or, or do you think he displaces one of those two players if we sign him? I mean, I agree with you. It's difficult to have him in your kind of 11 replacing Gabriel, who, who I think is a future Arsenal captain. Agree, so yeah. if he therefore was directly replaced, then it's counterproductive. But Arsenal do need defensive depth. And I do think that Gabriel and Martinez could play alongside each other as well. Potentially, you don't spend the best part of 45 million and then just have him as a squad player. And the other thing as well is that if you're serious about Lissandro Martinez, you're not going to get him at Arsenal if your pitch is that there's a squad fit rather yeah. than a first 11 fit. So Arsenal want him in their starting 11. That's my understanding. And rightly so, wow. because he's a tremendous player with a range of really, really good attributes. And Arsenal were obviously a week or so ago kind of the clear front runners because they were preparing a third bid and Manchester United hadn't really even entered the fray apart from a few rumblings. And then a week on towards the end of last week, United really upped their game. And naturally, Arsenal fans will be a little bit panicked because they will assume, as people often do, that the Ten Hag link will be the difference. But my understanding is that Martinez has also sold on Arteta, who's played another really active role in this one. So it's an uh, open race, but Ten Hag is pushing extremely hard and the player is more familiar with him. 
So logically, from the outside in and from talking to Manchester United sources, they are very, very confident of agreeing a kind of all-in deal for just shy of 45 million that will get him there. But when I talk to Arsenal sources, they're still maintaining that they're firmly in the race as well. So hopefully we'll get some more clarity on this one over the coming days. But both clubs are pushing extremely hard to try and get this deal done and quickly. And the thing to add about Martinez is that when you look at a fit in the side, he can play left central defender, but also left back and even left kind of controlling midfielder as well. And that's what I mean about the versatility of the attributes and why he would be such a good signing. So when people are trying to fit him into an Arsenal side, that's really important to know as well, that Arteta could have two or three plans for Martinez within his starting eleven, and it's very much that yeah. versatility. Then you look at Manchester United, and when you factor him in, say, at centre-back, there's then suddenly a question mark over Harry Maguire and how many games he might get in a World Cup year. But again, it's that fact that he can go over on the left, he can play in the centre, he can move into midfield as well. So I think that it's that ability to use the kind of adaptability and the, the willingness and hunger from what I gather of the player um, to contribute to the squad in those variety of different positions. That's what makes him such a bargain, even at a 45 million fee. Yeah, that'll be interesting how that one plays out over the next few weeks then, I'm sure. Um, just quickly, one thing I wanted to ask you before we kind of rounded up the Arsenal stuff was... Um, Rafinha, obviously, that one just kind of, this one's been a bit of a roller coaster. All of a sudden, it looked as if we might get him. And I was thinking, again, this isn't a priority position. So 50, 60 million on a winger. But then I kind of got my head around the fact, okay, we're going to get him. I'm excited. Then I thought he was going to Chelsea, which I was furious about. And then he's on holiday and it seems as if he's waiting for Barcelona, but they're having financial issues. Where is that at at the moment? Is it viewed as he will go to Barcelona once the money is there or is there still a chance he ends up at Chelsea or even maybe at Arsenal? I think Arsenal never matched Chelsea's bid. They considered it and Edu, from what I gather on the afternoon or evening that Chelsea made the bid, was constantly calling and then waiting for Deco to give him clarification. And Arsenal took 48 hours to determine whether or not they would match Chelsea's bid and haven't to date. And one of the reasons for that is because, as you correctly say, it's since became apparent that Rafinha really wanted Barcelona, who themselves have now got cash injection. But let's not forget that Barcelona want Lewandowski, who I still think is their number one priority. They have to resolve the future of Dembele at the time of this recording anyway. A deal could still be signed, but Dembele keeps delaying a pay cut deal. De Jong must be resolved as well. And there's other players waiting to potentially come into Barcelona. Jules Kunde is another one that's being linked as well. So it's not a given that just because Barcelona have got the cash injection, they'll immediately be able to strike a deal with Leeds United. And again, at the time of recording, things could change this week, but it was widely reported in Spain that Leeds and Barcelona had agreed a package and the only major difference between Chelsea's offer and Barcelona's offer was staggered payments for the base fee. But the reality, as I understand it and have reported over the last week or so, is Leeds and Barcelona do not have a final deal with everything agreed at this point. So Rafinha is in a difficult position because he is open to the Chelsea move. That's my understanding. So the financials are not a problem. Chelsea have offered him a five-year deal. The base wage is agreeable to Rafinha and it's a big pay rise from at Leeds United. And yeah. given a straight choice come the end of this window between Chelsea and Leeds, I think Rafinha still moves to Chelsea. But he may not have that option come the end of the window because Chelsea know that their tactic to get Rafinha is to move fast, to try and blow Barcelona away and to essentially say to Rafinha, decide and it's a World Cup year. So do yeah. you want to play for us? Have your future settled, come back from your holiday, go on a pre-season tour, play Champions League football, go off to the World Cup. 
Or do you want to let this linger for the entire window and then Barcelona might come in, but they might not. And then who knows? Chelsea may not even leave the offer lingering for the duration of the window. So Chelsea's tactic is to feed into that uncertainty. Rafinha yeah. for now, as you would expect, is just waiting and seeing. And as the window progresses, it'll be interesting to see that power dynamic. Because if Chelsea withdraw their offer or make the threat of that, Rafinha has got a decision to make. But right now, Chelsea and Rafinha are waiting to see what Barcelona can do. Now, I know there's some reports out there that say he'll stay at Leeds until January and then Barcelona will promise to come in. I think that's a risky tactic and it's not my understanding at this point that Rafinha will commit to that and Leeds have already kind of spent the money on a replacement yeah. for Rafinha and that's a kind of another factor to the deal that Luis Sinistera is coming in from Feyenoord and if Rafinha just stays at Leeds, then great in some senses for Jesse Marsh, but it becomes very unsettled and uncertain. And I don't really yeah. think Leeds want that, even though he's a quality player for Leeds United. They don't want a player that's just waiting for a move to happen. And then imagine yeah. if Rafinha has to start at Leeds and then go to a World Cup and then come back from a World Cup and then resolve the future from there on in. And I think that that yeah. will be a factor in his decision making as well so i don't think that this has had all of its twists yet i don't think that chelsea are entirely out of the race of course rafinha wants to go to barcelona of course barcelona want rafinha but he has to sort of think about his own football in a world cup year because he's only won four caps for brazil in 2022 and i think he got five more in 2021 and if Leeds don't like how he's acting if he doesn't play as much football because they sort of want to banish him. I mean, that would be harsh from Marsh. So I certainly don't want to imply that that's their thinking, but I'm just putting it out there. If he's not playing at the right level at the right club ahead of a World Cup with only nine Brazil caps, then who knows mm. what's going to happen. Whereas if he plays for Chelsea, plays Champions League football, does well, it sells everything leading up to Qatar 2022. So that will be across his thinking as well. So it's a case of watch this space. But at the moment, Arsenal haven't matched Chelsea's offer. So it is likely to be a two-way decision now, not a three-way decision. That wasn't the case, by the way. A few weeks back, Arsenal were seriously considering uh, making this a three-way race. But at the moment, it looks like Chelsea know Barcelona is the preference, but they're still hanging around just in case that agreement between Leeds and Barcelona doesn't happen. Mm. Very interesting, man. It, it changes so quickly, don't it, in the transfer world? I mean, um, just one more that I want to touch you was um, Nicolas Pepe. I saw a report a few days ago that Arsenal may be willing to let him leave, even potentially on loan. Now, when you think £72 million record signing, um, still got a couple of years left on his deal. I mean, are, are Arsenal actively seeking to let him go? It, it just seems like a bit of a strange situation when you've spent so much money on a player. Yeah, absolutely. You're right to flag the fee. And I suppose there's an immediate comparison almost with... Romelu Lukaku, where, again, contracted long-term, huge price tag hanging over their head, and for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out. And then you have to look for a way to recoup some money or get the player out on loan in a way where you can reinvent them, they can find their yeah. confidence and their form, and a loan is obviously a safe way of doing that. I've seen the reports that suggest that Arsenal might be looking for some kind of loan move to Spain. Club sources are not really at this stage giving that much more intimation as to how things are progressing. And they're naturally coy on it because whatever happens, Arsenal could end up losing some money from this. So I think that the window for Pepe is going to be a kind of quite uncertain time. And yeah. the sources that I speak to are still pushing a narrative that a loan departure is a likely scenario. They're not saying that it's a definite scenario, but they've yeah. built it 
for the last kind of few weeks as a likely scenario. And under a loan deal, especially if it has an option or who knows, even an obligation to buy, I've not been given any intimation on that at this stage, but any kind of deal will be at a loss as far as Arsenal are concerned. I think that it's fair to say they're actively looking at suitors and that a loan would be the most likely scenario and Spain would be the most likely destination. But personally, others may know more than me on this one because right at the start, like I said to you, I try and kind of focus on US-based angles or big club incoming. Mm. So I don't claim to be an expert specifically on Pepe's future, but it was something that I'd asked in yeah. conversations around other players with sources. And that was my understanding that there's an openness, there's a kind of activeness to try and find a solution and a loan is the most likely scenario. But if they do let him go in any capacity, especially if it's, let's say, loan with an option or obligation to buy, then unfortunately there'll be money lost on that deal in all likelihood. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's a shame, really. But um, you were saying there about the American angle. I mean, obviously the Arsenal owners, Stan Kroenke and, and Josh Kroenke, they always seem to come to the forefront of conversation at Arsenal. And we see the LA Rams winning the Super Bowl, his club in Colorado win the Stanley Cup. We've always kind of felt like the side dish, if you like. You know, we're just the we're just the coleslaw, and you know, we're not the meat and the and the rice on the plate. Uh, <laughs> do, do you think there is an attitude change with them? Because as much as I haven't been big fans of them, they have invested a lot of money um, since Arteta has been in charge. Do you think they are trying now to maybe turn around this feeling that the fans have got towards them? I think we've just got a sort of habit now in the Premier League of a number of owners being a little bit distant. And that's what's going yeah. to hopefully be quite refreshing about the Chelsea ownership that Todd Bowley, and he has to be at the moment, is the operational controller of the football club. He's the chairman. He's the interim sporting director in the process of bidding for the football club. He engaged directly with fan groups. And long may that approach continue because that's what you yeah. want. As a football fan, owners shouldn't be like Abramovich was at Chelsea, even if that comes with success. There should be an engagement as to what the strategy is on and off the football field because fans pay hard-earned money and they not only want success and you may not ever have the ability to be told all the ins and outs of signings and potentials and finances because a lot of that remains private, but you certainly expect to know about your strategy, about the growth of the football club and the brands. You want to know where it fits into the wider portfolio. You want to know the long-term commitment. You want to know improvements around fan engagement. And I know that some of these things are not sexy, but ultimately, and I know Arsenal fans won't like me using this as an example, but when you look at Tottenham and you look at their new stadium uh -oh. and you look at small <laughs> like the digital transformation, the way that you can cut down queue time, the NFL coming to the stadium, concerts, non-football business. Again, none of this is more important to a fan than is Yuri Tielemans joining, but yeah. what Tottenham have done quite well and what I think that Chelsea will do quite well with their development is modernise. And from your owners, you need to know what their plans are to keep pace on and off the football field. So hopefully we're going to see more engagement. I don't think it's fair to say that Arsenal are not the priority. I just think it is a reality that football is not the priority over American football. So when you have an American owner, they consume American football in a slightly different way. It is far more marketed and commercialised. Fan engagement is more important. And you see this, for example, just moving away from Arsenal with, say, basketball, where they'll play in 20, if not 30 different kits throughout a season. They'll have a special Halloween night. They'll have a Pride-themed month, all of which are great, but football hasn't quite moved there. So I think the short answer is that I would be glad as a football fan of an American owner 
and American investors at any football club right now because it's only going to grow from strength to strength in terms of commercial opportunities that will benefit the football club, brand opportunities that will benefit the football club. And all of this translates back to money that can be invested into the football club to bring players in that narrow that gap between where Arsenal are now and let's say Chelsea first and foremost based on last season and then eventually Liverpool and Manchester City. And the reason for that is because and why I say an American owner, I would take over any other nationality, regardless of who they are, as long as they're sensible and sustainable, is because you've got the 2026 World Cup in America, Canada and Mexico. And I think unlike USA 94, where it really didn't have a huge knock on effect, this World Cup, more than most, is going to be massive for the growth of football in America. And Arsenal with American backing and Chelsea with American backing and so on are really going to be able to benefit from that over the course of the next few years. And it won't sound exciting to an Arsenal fan now because the first step to that is in getting American partners and sponsors. And who knows, maybe those from Mexico and Canada, that sort of area. But as that translates into shirt sponsors or backing or investment of some sort, it will all eventually circle back towards the football side of things. And that's why I think that it's a really good time to have any kind of American affiliated to your football club. Well, you're giving us a little bit of optimism there. I hope you're right, Ben. I hope you're right. Um, I've done with the Arsenal stuff. Before we finish, because um, loads of other fans were messaging me as well saying... Can you ask him about Ronaldo and Raheem Sterling? I think they're at the moment the two headlines. Um, I mean, I've been sending loads of text messages to my Man United friends, you know, Viva Ronaldo and all of that. It looks looks a bit of a mess at the moment. But is there any way in the world that Cristiano Ronaldo ends up at Chelsea next season? Because for me, it looks highly unlikely that how could United sell him to another English club? But are they maybe thinking it's a problem they don't need? Do you think there's any possibility he ends up at Chelsea? I think with Ronaldo, it's such a difficult situation. And I would preface, first of all, by saying that we know he's been through a difficult few months for family reasons. Yeah. So when he misses training for two straight days for family reasons, we have to be responsible as journalists in relaying that Manchester United have accepted that and then everyone will connect it to his future because of what's transpired. But it is important to stress that family reasons have been a factor for Ronaldo since, unfortunately, the death of a newborn. And everybody rallied around, as they should, rightly, in the football community to show him support. So yeah. it's turned into a conversation about his future because it's been apparent that Mendes met Bowley, Mendes offered Ronaldo to Bayern. So we do know he wants out, but yeah. let's just be responsible when we hear that family reasons are at play to be respectful of the fact that, who knows, we might learn more. It's likely that Ronaldo is considering his future and wants it resolved quickly. But by the same token, he's given a reason of family situation and to an extent we need to respect that as journalists as well and Manchester United the same but with Ronaldo's future separate to that it is highly likely if Ronaldo wants to leave Manchester United and finds a club that Manchester United cannot do anything so their formal position wow. is that Cristiano Ronaldo is not for sale and they'll maintain that that is their position until Ronaldo finds a club if Ronaldo finds a club, it's that classic case of player power versus club power. And I don't think that Manchester United and Ten Hag will keep Cristiano Ronaldo at Manchester United Football Club for another season if Ronaldo has a concrete offer. Then it gets interesting because if that was Chelsea, are Manchester United going to sell to a Premier League club? On Chelsea specifically, there's never been an indication that Thomas Tuchel wants Ronaldo or that Ronaldo would fit into his system. And I think Thierry Henry summed it up really well when he said, Ronaldo is your poison and your medicine. He's your medicine because he's going to get you 20 plus goals, but he's your poison because you have to build a team around him. And Ronaldo's yeah. not going to go to Chelsea and be a bit part player. So if Chelsea, and we know these were the targets, even if they don't get them, if Chelsea gets Sterling and Rafinha and then Ronaldo comes in as well, then either you build the team around Ronaldo or Ronaldo is just one of a number of top players at Chelsea. 
And that's not of appeal to Tuchel. It's not of appeal to Ronaldo. So it's not a fit at Chelsea. So it all depends mm. on whether Tuchel can be persuaded by Bowley in particular and the majority owner, Clear Lake Capital, an investment firm in Santa Monica, that Ronaldo is worth it for the brand. And those conversations haven't happened in depth yet. And that's telling because Todd Bowley met Mendes about two weeks ago now, and still Tuchel and Bowley have not had a meaningful conversation about Ronaldo. So if Bowley gets his way, I don't see Ronaldo joining Chelsea. And I think that if Bowley somehow persuades Ronaldo an offer is to be made, then that is against what I'm being told, which is that Tuchel will have control over all players. Yeah. Now, of course, if Ronaldo ends up at Chelsea, we're going to hear a PR narrative that says Tuchel always wanted him. He's great yeah. for everything. But at the moment, if Ronaldo comes to Chelsea, it will be because the ownership group are flexing not, as I understand it, because the manager can make a football argument for Ronaldo to come to the club. He can make lots of non-football arguments, but there's not many football arguments that warrant a 37-year-old joining a football club when your two current targets in an attacking sense are Raheem Sterling and Rafinha. And Ronaldo comes with a lot of pros, but also baggage and a dressing room as well. So yeah. I would say it is highly unlikely but at the moment, even though there's no indication that Tuchel wants Ronaldo, Bowley and Tuchel still need to have much more in-depth conversations before any final decision is made. But Chelsea haven't put down an offer. Chelsea haven't advanced it at this point. Then other suitors, Napoli are 100% interested. And by the way, Manchester United would do the best bit of business ever if somehow, I think it's impossible, but they could get Victor Oshiman to go the other way, whose mm. value around 80 to 85 million. But Manchester United will win if that's their scenario. And Napoli are interested and they've got Champions League football. It remains to be seen whether they can get a deal done. Real Madrid link always going to be made. I don't see it. Barcelona are creeping into the conversation as well. PSG are not interested. And Bayern are waiting and seeing. Their interest is real, even though they are kind of denying it at the moment, a very normal tactic. But yeah. they're waiting and seeing as slash when Lewandowski becomes Barca bound and then they might enter the race. But the challenge with Ronaldo is just that 37, yeah. build a team around him. You have amazing return when he scores, but if he doesn't, he's becoming more and more and I don't mean this derogatory, but a passenger in the game. And these yeah. teams that want to defend from the attack, uh, to have their attackers track back into midfield, their midfielders track back into defence, high energy, high pressure, they don't suit Ronaldo. And that's why I think that Thomas Tuchel will hold his gun here, because it's an early test, really, for Tuchel. He'll probably be quite glad of the link, because yeah. it's an opportunity for him to almost say, OK, Let's test out under these American owners whether my say has veto or whether yeah. actually, even though you're telling me I've got control over transfers, you're trying to persuade me that a player that I don't really want should be factored in. So yeah. it's fun to watch, but nothing is advanced at the moment between Chelsea and Ronaldo. And there are naturally other suitors also with Champions League football that Mendes has also offered him too. With Sterling, I think it's as good yeah. as a double deal and will be completed by the end of this week. The wow. clubs should have terms agreed today or tomorrow. The delay on it going from a full agreement to just advanced is the fact that in conversations with Manchester City, Chelsea have also been looking at Nathan Ake as well. They're effectively two separate deals being negotiated at the same time. Yeah. But I think Chelsea have, over the last two weeks, wanted clarity on both. And maybe that slowed things down a little bit. But Sterling will be about 45 million, similar price to Gabriel Jesus with add-ons on top. He's already sold his house. Personal terms wow. shouldn't be a problem. And uh, I expect Chelsea... Uh, to have no panic, complications, hurdles, late twists on Sterling. Uh, I believe, based on my understanding, and the last time I checked in on this was yesterday, uh, that this deal will be fully wrapped up this week and Raheem Sterling uh, will be 
a Chelsea player next season. Wow, big signing that. You can get Sterling and, and Jesus at 45 million each is is definitely a bargain. A player that, you know, we were hoping that we could have maybe got to Arsenal, but I think as soon as Champions League football disappeared, that was over. Uh, my last question for you of the day. I appreciate your time. It's been a great show. A lot of people have been asking me about Serge Gnabry. Now, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but it's a bit of a, a dream for Arsenal fans. We've seen links that Man City could actually go for him as Raheem Sterling's replacement. Um, do you know much about, about Serge Gnabry's situation? Yeah, it's funny how Twitter works because things get recycled. And I was reporting on Serge Gnabry a few weeks back. And Arsenal were definitely keeping him on their radar without necessarily doing a great deal more. And that was at the same time that they were refusing to put 60 million down for Rafinha. And actually, before even Chelsea had really seriously got to a position where they thought the deal was going to get done. And I was sort of looking at Gnabry Rafinha in a comparative way and explaining how Arsenal would need to be decisive with both players, really. And with Rafinha, it very much proved to be the case that Chelsea came straight in, gazumped Arsenal's offers at the time and were able to progress things. And then that created a chain reaction from Barcelona and Arsenal were out the mix. With Gnabry, my point was that if Arsenal are to revisit and were to revisit at the time, they would again have to be decisive and put quite a large amount of money down on the table, not to the tune of the 30 or 35 million, but probably an extra 15 or so million, if not more, some would say. And it depends whether Gnabry is going to end up the subject of a bidding war. And as you correctly say, the situation at the moment is that Manchester United and Manchester City are looking and Arsenal are monitoring. And by monitoring, and it's really important to explain this because monitoring will get used on Twitter and I'll get shown a tweet from someone else saying they're not monitoring him and the Arsenal <laughs> fans will be confused and have headaches. Monitoring does not necessarily mean on a shortlist or bidding or in talks. Monitoring is a normal thing that clubs do. And some people use this word accurately and some don't. When sources tell you they are monitoring, it usually means they are watching what other clubs do before determining if they are going to enter the race at all. So right now, I think Arsenal have other priorities. And I think there's an acceptance that Gnabry would probably, if they proceed, pick a Manchester City or a Manchester United. And I don't think that Arsenal are in any position where they are entering a race or prioritising a race, but they are keeping the player there in a back pocket. I suppose a bit like Tielemans, but the difference is that Tielemans has history and Gnabry and Arsenal haven't done anything. But you never tend to rule out a player. You never tend to say no unless you yeah. absolutely don't want them. So Liverpool sources, for example, told me with Dembele, no. The links are nonsense. They're completely fake. With Gnabry, it's a little bit different. And Arsenal are just kind of sitting on the periphery without confirming that he's a priority, without confirming he's a target, without moving forwards in any way, shape or form. But they're looking at it. They're seeing what Man City do. They're seeing at what Manchester United do. And if they don't get other targets, who knows? So I would call that a you never say never. He's on mm. the radar. And as I said in an interview I did a while back now, if they want him, then they're going to have to be decisive. But no indication at this point that they are going to act. So it's one of those names that will excite, uh, will be yeah. spoken about. Uh, will be listed as a maybe, listed as a backup. But I don't think there's too much substance at this point other than the fact that he's there on a the radar, uh, but not necessarily a shortlist. And that will like really annoy fans because yeah. throughout the window, you're going to hear us journalists say words like interested or admire or radar or monitor. And um, I try and give context because when I use these words... I'm choosing my words carefully with a very defined definition. And maybe in the same way that you fans like to put medals and tear us journalists, which we all find very <laughs> amusing, maybe I should have a lexicon of words to make it clear. 
what that it means. Monitor means never say never. And yeah. radar means monitoring, i.e. you've taken a step up and you're looking based upon what other suitors are doing. So that's when you get into hijack territory. And then shortlist means an allocated target. So it's more in your control. So a hijack yeah. deal is where you monitor what other clubs do and you go, well, hang on a minute, we're going to come in here. It's opportunistic. But if you'd have asked the club two months before if that player was on the shortlist, the answer is probably no. Shortlist yeah. is the opposite. And Arsenal have done this a lot where you just proceed with your own targets and that's where you might be the one that gets hijacked. And then from there, I think fans are very clear on terminology that a bid is a bid or an advance mm. box means that you are in a much stronger position to get the deal over the line. But obviously Twitter doesn't look at when you said the quote. It doesn't no, look no, no. the context that you've given. It just wants the summary and it wants the percentage. So people are like, is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? Yes or no. The transfer yeah. window, particularly early in a deal, very rarely has a yes or no. And I don't mean to be a fence-sitting journalist, but I like to be as responsible as I can and give you insight. And if people yeah. think that's waffle or if people prefer to consume their transfer window, with yes, no, or 90% done answers, then great. But be prepared to be disappointed at times because when you take a percentage guess or take a yes, no early in a deal, then you are probably giving a personal opinion that has more substance and credence through putting two and two together, perhaps, or a yeah. source or insight, but you probably know more than Edu. And that's the sort of interesting thing that if people like Edu, and I'm not saying a specific source here, but sporting directors will often be upfront and honest and tell you things up record. And if they don't know, then I honestly think it becomes irresponsible for a journalist to then be saying it's highly likely. So if you hear me say highly likely, it's because three or four sources have probably told me that it's as good as a done deal. If yeah. you hear 90% likely in the early stage of a deal. So if someone now says Lissandro Martinez is 90% likely to pick Manchester United over Arsenal, it's just a hedge betting, sensationalized, clickbait. Yeah view and they might well be right because it's logical that Manchester United are pushing hard but it's also irresponsible because Arsenal say it's an open race people close to Martinez say it's an open race Manchester United privately despite their confidence say it's an open race so in a week's time Man United might have him but that doesn't mean at this point it's 90% likely and that is okay. why I try and use my words very carefully. And if that means these long-winded, waffly answers where unfortunately <laughs> you actually aren't any closer to knowing what the reality would be, then yeah. go and follow somebody else because I'm trying to be a bit more highbrow and tell you it how it actually is at the time of recording. And if that drives you nuts, then go and listen <laughs> to other people. But hopefully it adds a bit more to the window and you start to understand how a transfer window actually works because it's complicated. Yeah. Um, so my headline tomorrow, by the way, Arsenal are monitoring. <laughs> I'm joking, by the way. But no, li <laughs> listen, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a brilliant, just shy of an hour. It's been really good. Thank you very much for giving up your time, giving us your insight. And, and, and listen, I like the fact that you don't just sensationalize, you know, headlines to just get more clicks, more views, because I can imagine... You know, I've seen some of these guys and, and the and the criticism and abuse they get with it as well. So I think it's important that you offer context behind it as well. So I appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Always happy to come on. And let's hope Arsenal uh, continue. And I do use the word continue to have a good window because Marquinhos, Vieira, Turner, Jesus, at this stage of a window, it's good business. And if one more comes in, then I think Arsenal fans should not see it as like, ugh, we missed out on Rafinha versus Chelsea or Barcelona. Ugh, we missed out if they miss out. Still an open race between mm -hmm. Manchester United and Arsenal for Martinez. And then you start breeding, particularly on social media, this like, ugh, Edu, he's blown it again. Mm -hmm. But given where Arsenal were in January and the disappointing window there, I think it's already a good window. And if one or two more come in, it could be a great window. So good luck to Arsenal. Let's hope that they have a, like I say, good pre-season um, and a good season. And as long as they don't finish above Leicester, all will be well. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, right, Ben, listen, if we get Yuri Tillemans wrapped up, I'll be dropping you a message anyway of a uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, but I appreciate you coming on. Everyone, make sure you go and follow him on Twitter, Ben Jacobs. Very good work, and I appreciate you coming on today, Ben. Pleasure, mate. All the best.